This is a video that I had planned on making for a while, but in the spur of the deluge of poor Mighty Number no. 9 reviews, the astounding number of delays for what seemingly started development as a run-of-the-mill Mega Man clone, and the I don't give a fuck washing of his hands of responsibility response from Inafune, I think it's about time we had to talk about the power of celebrity and nostalgia for games gone by clouding our collective judgment when it comes to this new world of crowdfunded games. Mighty Number no. 9 seems to have taken a significant portion of heat for being a mediocre game. The biggest part has to do with fans funding the game for the promise of a substitute Mega Man and that feel of butterflies in your stomach that can only come from receiving a warm smile from a clever businessman. Full disclosure here, I have absolutely no financial investment in Mighty Number no. 9. I did not kickstart it and I did not purchase the the game. I've also had the chance to meet Kiji and Afune, as evidenced by my channel icon and this short clip. I guess in general, uh, my question is, do Japanese games suck? <laughs> 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 So I've been a fan of the original X series and Legend series of Mega Man, and the Battle Network series was pretty cool too. I even went out and bought a 3DS, unbeknownst to me, of the ill-fated Mega Man Legends 3 that we would never end up receiving. I'll admit, I highly respected Kiji's radical views and unspoken commentary, at least by Japanese game dev standards, of how stagnation was beginning to set in the Japanese game industry, and he was one of the most prominent voices to attempt to unify Eastern and Western game development ideas in the market. I'll give him full credit where it's due. It was an extremely risky move to go fully independent, uproot yourself, and travel to another country to start all over again. Again. But in retrospect, that sounds like a fairy tale version of the true events, because in actuality, it was all pure fantasy. If you look at all of the events that have transpired since Compcept's inception, then you'll know that Kiji did not revolutionize anything, but instead, he played it extremely safe. So in 2013, Kiji published his Kickstarter video with the initial goal of only $900,000, which seemed like a very reasonable budget for a 2D platform platformer with a formula that was already in place to borrow heavily from, this Mega Man clone was quickly funded and it superseded some of its own stretch goals only to end up with around $4 million. Around this point, the scope of this little 2D platformer got way out of control. I call this the Tim Schafer effect. You start off by getting people to invest in your initial idea and your previous reputation. Then, you start making ambitious promises and increasing the scale of said game. And then you end up adding celebrity voices and letting your Twitter demeanor and professionalism go out of control. Then you shit on the people who used to invest in your ideas and the current people investing in your ideas. Something, something, puppets. Then you abandon said project and then you announce another one. I think Mighty Number no. 9's issue is the same kind of issue that many of these teams with monolithic development developers attached to them have. The team is too afraid to speak up to their iconic leader and reel back the ideas back into reasonable territory. Just imagine being a former Capcom employee and jumping ship to help out a radical former developer that's known in your country for criticizing a place that values tradition. I mean, you can't go back to find another job after this. Your prospects are pretty much finished. You're stuck. KG is your boss now and you don't don't want to lose that position that you gave everything to have. Meanwhile, the $4 million is running out, your game is getting delayed multiple times, and the boss comes up to you and says the only way to keep this company afloat is to push out something, which is better than nothing, and go along with the announcement of a sequel to that game, and another game series, and two respective anime series. So what do you do here? 
to you know, confront him and risk losing your job? This type of celebrity developer meddling with proven concepts isn't exclusive to just crowdsource games. There's no better example out there of a developer that's past their prime and resting on former glory than Nintendo's own Shigeru Miyamoto. Just take a look at this graphic here that I did not make. It seems as if either hubris or plain ignorance to the voice of the players has allowed this man to continually homogenize games by taking control away from the teams that have proven once before before to have a successful concept only to have their ideas outright dismissed by Miyamoto. And no one wants to talk to God and tell God that he's wrong in his design. This is the true terror that many teams face from questioning a living icon. There seems to be an interesting dichotomy of developer philosophies going on at the big end. Take a look at Al Numa, the director of The Legend of Zelda The Breath of the Wild. Al Numa hired a team of young and new programmers that grew up playing well Western games that are currently questioning the conventions of the 30-year-old Legend of Zelda series. Personally, I'm excited to hear that the new Zelda will be a complete deconstruction of the series. A breath of fresh air, if you will. However, it still seems as if the team is afraid of old Miyamoto strolling in and flopping his dick on the table and telling everyone that the new Zelda needs more tutorials because the audience is too dumb to understand how the game works. Read this quote and try not to cry. That does doesn't mean Miyamoto is gone, however. To the development team, Miyamoto is God. Alnuma says, even when I say, hey, this is what I think should be done, they'll always question, well, what would Miyamoto say? It is of my opinion that all developers should operate under a system of checks and balances. And it's sad to say, but that system of checks and balances usually comes from a big money publisher tied to a project. You see, ambition is a great quality to have when it comes to having a creative mindset in creating a video game. The biggest part of any project, and I'm not just talking about video games here, is to operate within your means and create a deadline and stick to it. As much as I hate to say it, Bobby Kotick knew what he was talking about when it came to Tim Schafer and Brutal Legend. Sometimes you need someone there to play the bad guy to keep the creative types in check and to release a quality product in a timely manner. Even if some ideas get left out or put on the cutting room floor and eventually repurposed into a future iteration. If you're a developer and you use crowdfunding and the goodwill of your fans to fund your game, the question you should ask ask yourself shouldn't be, how do I get more money, but instead, how do I work with what I have to keep the promise I made? Once again, I'm going to bring up one of the best examples that our gaming industry has to offer when it comes to understanding budget and limitations, meeting creativity. I'm talking about Vanillaware. Yes, I am. George Kamatani, a former employee of Capcom, mind you, his little company has stayed the course on the philosophy of squeezing love out of a small budget. Dragon's Crown, one of the most gorgeous games the world has ever seen, a true-to-form 2D team-based beat-em-up, was created by a team of 26 employees and a budget of only $1 million, which up until that point was the company's highest budgeted game. So they made other awesome games under an even smaller budget. This is a self-described team of artists that came together, worked within their means, and have produced phenomenal works of art without compromising their vision in search of more money. Are you listening out there? I'm not saying you shouldn't ever have faith in a developer or you shouldn't back a Kickstarter, but I think you should take a closer look at the developer's track record and see why they either were fired or quit their company if they were able to release games in a timely manner, if ambition met up with reality, those sort of things. I'm looking to the newer developers for the future of games because I look at developers like Yacht Club Games, the creators of Shovel Knight, and Austin Jorgensen, the creator of Lisa, the Painful RPG, hell, even Scott Cawthorn, the creator of Five Nights at Freddy's, and Toby Fox, the creator of Undertale. Now, you may personally not like some of these games, but you have to respect that these are people that worked under a micro budget, created a concept, and delivered on their promise, and then some. What I'm saying is these former iconic developers out there asking for these millions of dollars need to prove themselves again that they can operate a company on their own first and put out any product. 
any product whatsoever, make that product successful, and then use that goodwill from starting over again to fund a bigger project. As much as I want to believe that Shinmu 3 is going to recapture the spirit of the Dreamcast, I think that Sega was right in letting Yu Suzuki go. Just look at Yu Suzuki here. We all know that Shinmu 3 is never going to live up to the vision in our mind of what Shinmu 3 could be. Yu Suzuki created a Shinmu universe and all these ideas of how it's going to be and all these episodes and just stretching out the plot between Ryo and Landy, but there's no finish line. It's, I've got this laid out, I'm going to need more money, I don't have an end game. Without a big company behind most of these guys to tell them, no, stop it, we're just going to end up with unfulfilled promises and we all lose from that. 